Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Lash Mama podcast. It is Melissa. We are back. Um, we are back after, not really after, because it is still very much going on, um, the COVID pandemic. Um, we're back in the office. We're podcasting a little bit, social distancing. Um, I have Emily Bruno here, and today we are going to talk about What happens if you are pregnant and you go into labor and you cannot have a doula present with you? Um, I know some hospitals are loosening up the rules a little bit, but some are still just allowing your partner to be present or one person being present. Um, So today we're going to talk about how that one person who is present, if they are not a doula, how they can support you. You're listening to the Latch Mama podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Wirt business owner, and tired mom of five. Join us each week as we talk about pregnancy, nursing, parenting, and all things motherhood. Hi. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited (laughs) to be here. I feel like I'm like this new, like, I don't know. I feel like I was just kind of let out of my shell a little bit, like in the sense that like, I really haven't talked to a whole lot of people Mm -hmm. and I kind of feel like I just babble every time I see somebody now. Cause I'm like, hi. And then this happened and then this (laughs) happened and oh my gosh. And it's just been me and my kids and my dog for like the last three months. Yeah. I don't really know how to talk to humans anymore. So yeah. Forgive me if I say something wrong or I ramble, but that's okay. I'm really happy you're here. I'm happy really happy here. that we're all starting to kind of come together a little bit, but not too close. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me a little quickly mm-hmm. uh, kind of about what the last couple of months have been like in the birth work world. Well, a lot, a lot, a lot has been happening. Um, it's pretty amazing how something like this, a situation like this with the pandemic really shows how all of these hospitals and hospital systems, they kind of are the, their own little fiefdoms mm-hmm. and they can just set their own rules and it's very, very arbitrary. Um, and how ultimately we as um, birthing people, customers, consumers have like very little say mm-hmm. on what happens in hospitals and um, what kind of options and resources we have. Um, so early on it was things were really reactive um and some hospitals went so far as to even restrict um spouses birth partners dads um from being able to come in when people were giving birth so it was like just that birthing person and that was it um but now thankfully um i i'm to my knowledge there aren't any hospitals in the us that are still doing that all of them are at least allowing like one support person um and then there are some hospitals that are also allowing a second support person if that is a a doula a professionally trained okay. doula to to come in and give support and so um thankfully here in richmond um, we are now back to doulas being welcome in all seven of the hospitals where people are giving birth. Um, and then it's just, there's just so much variance through the rest of the country. For a while, though, mm-hmm. some of the Richmond hospitals did not allow doulas. That's correct. Until, until <laughs> I, um, I teamed up with Melissa and Latched Mama oh, yeah. and we wrote a strongly worded letter. <laughs> and- so funny. You just forget like things literally like the last few months have just been one thing after another after another. I completely forgot that we helped you a little bit with that. Yeah. Um, it was all you, though. We just <laughs> we just helped put the words on paper for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think, was there a good reaction to the letter? Did you? Very good reaction. And um, we got a lot of providers um, and nurses to sign on to it and to publicly state that they also believed that doulas um, are essential personnel and should always be welcome, you know, in the hospital as part of the birthing team. Um, and so that's what we're back to thankfully. Um, and, you know, there were also a lot of medical organizations that said that doulas are essential personnel. And that is why some hospitals continued to welcome us, you know, from, you know, all the way through up until this point. Um, I mean, I but, feel like some of the things that people were talking about during the pandemic, like, you know, you stay at home a little bit longer, or, you know, we want people in hospitals less. I mean, I feel mm-hmm. like 
the quick answer to a lot of that is a doula. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I can understand wanting to limit the amount of people coming to the hospital, but I feel like in a lot of ways you all kind of help the situation in terms of, you know, keeping people home a little bit longer and stuff like that. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And, and the argument that we made in the letter that we wrote was that the benefits of having a doula are known and measurable, whereas the potential risk for that second support person is not known and cannot be measured. And there isn't any evidence to support keeping us out. Absolutely. But there's lots of evidence to support us being there. Um, and so for a little while, we we had a few um, clients within our group that um, we offered and provided virtual support for. We did okay. not go into the hospital with them, but we are now back entirely to um, supporting our clients in person. Um, and um, so one thing that one thing that I see in a lot of conversations and like national message boards, I'm in a lot of online mom groups and feedback support groups and stuff like that. And um, people are asking like, well, should I even bother getting a doula if they can't come into the hospital with me? And my answer to that is a resounding yes. Absolutely. Because the, the amount of time that we spend in the hospital compared to everything else that we provide for our clients is a very small percentage of it. So a doula's job starts the day that you hire them and they're offering prenatal support and education and information and they're helping you to navigate your appointments with your provider and making sure that you're asking all the right questions and getting the answers that you need and you feel really confident going into your birth. And then they offer labor support in person at home, Mm -hmm. you know, so even if your doula can't go to the hospital with you, they can still labor with you at home and get you through, you know, the door to the Mm -hmm. hospital. And um, we had one family that we worked with where we walked them up, their doula walked them up to the door and had packed them a bag of labor support tools. And so (laughs) they gave it to the dad and he was able to take like all her stuff into the room with them and set up the crock pot and the herbs for the compresses and the Christmas lights. And he had her massage oil and all of that. And then she FaceTimed with them and did, you know, everything basically from the parking lot. But, um, that's uh, so so like we are still showing up for our clients in any way that we're able to, you know, even, Um, even just that we were just talking about this prior to, to starting recording, we were talking about just the end of pregnancy. I mean, in general, just mm -hmm. kind of the second guessing and the anxiety and just yeah. there's a lot of hormones at play towards the end. Um, and I know I've had five babies, all of which pretty much at home, one was a car, but no matter how confident I felt going into a birth, there's still that end where mm-hmm. you just kind of start to question yourself and your yep. decisions. And then you throw a pandemic in. Yeah. And I can't even imagine, you know, not having a support s- system or somebody in place at that time. So, yeah, you know, even out of hospital support, I think is so important, especially right now. Yeah. Um, what we kind of wanted to dive in a little bit to today is for those people who are not allowed to perhaps have a person other than their partner in the room with them. Um, what are some things that we can kind of educate each other about in Mm -hmm. terms of support, um, that we can provide, um, you know, to the birthing person if, you know, we're the partner, not a doula. Yeah. So um, I gave this some thought (laughs) and decided to kind of tackle it from the angle of, well, you know, what are the big things that we know that we can really prioritize um, to help um, get a low intervention birth? And by low intervention, I just mean um, as few interventions as might be necessary for you. And so we do lots of education with our birth clients and with our uh, childbirth education classes. And and I tell everybody from the start, like, um, there are lots of interventions that are available to us at the end of pregnancy and in labor. Um, and they none of them are inherently bad things. Like every single intervention that we have access to, whether it's like um, – uh, a Foley bulb to open the cervix or p- 
Pitocin to make contractions or um, uh, access to a vacuum or forceps or a C-section or any of those things. All of these um, tools came about because there was a demonstrated need for them at one time. Um, and so they aren't inherently bad. They're just sometimes used injudiciously. And so we try to instead make it a goal of, you know, people confidently deciding what's best for them. Because it could be that for you and your baby to have the best outcome possible, you might need to use some of these tools. Absolutely. So we're not trying to go into it saying like no medicine, no medication, no interventions, no tools, but really more of an attitude of like what's going to be best for you. Um, and whether or not somebody's planning to um, get an epidural, there's all through early labor, which is that process of the body dilating from zero to six centimeters and people really getting like their um, longer, stronger, closer together contractions, the ones that are really making lots of cervical change. Um, whether or not you're planning to get an epidural eventually, the information for early labor is all pretty much the same. And f we support, well, so what ACOG says, and that's the society for um, OBGYNs in America, and they write all of the policy and position papers that most hospitals use to write their own policies. And they have a couple of really, inter um, really, really interesting, fascinating papers about, uh, fascinating to me at least, <laughs> <laughs> you might, other people might like fall asleep in the middle of them and it'll be snoozeville, but I love them. Um, but they have a really, they have two papers that I love to quote all the time. And one of them is about prevention of the primary cesarean. And the other one is about um, promotion of the low intervention birth. And they say that um, people should be, we should be doing less C-sections and using less interventions in labor because most people don't need them. And for the majority of people, if they can get a low intervention vaginal birth, then outcomes are better. And so in that paper, they say, in both of them, they say, number one thing that I want to talk about, stay at home in early labor. And they tell their doctors, if possible, if it's a healthy mom, healthy baby, low risk pregnancy, and somebody shows up at the hospital and they're not in active labor, and that means they're not having contractions about every three minutes, that those people should probably go home and stay home until they are in active labor. That's so hard though. I think when you I pack know. your bags and you show up and yes. you know, hey, I'm here to have a baby. And then what do you tell your family if yep. you've already, t oh, it's, it's, I know. it's tough. I know. I, I really, really empathize. Having had those first contractions myself yeah. <laughs> and knowing the excitement that comes over you. Um, but so what we tell people is, you know, the reason that you're encouraged to stay home in, in early labor is what the research tells us is that if you arrive in active labor, you're mm -hmm. less likely to need Pitocin um, to get narcotics uh, in labor and narcotic pain relief. Um, to need a vacuum assistance, to need forceps assistance, you're less likely to have a C-section. Because I feel like what a lot of people don't sometimes realize is that you could be quipping right along fine at home, but mm -hmm. if you're not in that established labor, active labor pattern, you could show up at the hospital, the lights could change, the way you feel could change, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden your body can be like, no dice. Yep. Just like, forget it. I don't want to do it. this. Because yeah. um, suddenly, I think there's something, adrenaline kicks in, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, start feeling fearful, like mm -hmm. this is the, this is really going to happen and things could slow down. Whereas if you go in when you're further along in labor, it's harder to s have outside influences that stop that yes. procedure a little bit. Is that correct? Yes, okay. it is. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's basically that the early labor phase um, is all about building up the momentum for your labor. And once you've like um, crested into this really excellent contraction pattern of maybe every three minutes or so, you're less likely to need medicine to keep that contraction pattern going. Because yeah, the the strangers and the bright lights and walking through the, the hallways of the hospital and all of those things um, can and do slow down our labors because it messes with those those labor hormones. Um, so uh, how do you tell if it's time to go to the hospital? Kind of the, the best thing that we can tell people is like, when you go to the hospital, the only thing that you should be doing 
is having contractions and laboring. If you're still even remotely interested in like talking, eating, sleeping, um, taking a walk, watching TV, listening to music, doing laundry, like if you can still be distracted by any of those things in between Mm -hmm. contractions, then you should still be at home. Um, and the only thing that should be happening when you're at the hospital is that you're having contractions. It is not time to hang out and watch Jerry Springer in your hospital room or HGTV. Is that still on? Yes, it is. Okay. And, right. and I, there's been a number of times where I've gotten to the hospital with my clients and some thoughtful nurse has turned on the TV and we walk in and Springer's on and I'm like, mute. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's yeah. Really so. Funny. Um, so yeah, if you're still capable of doing any of that other stuff, then, then you should be at home optimally. Um, and, uh, and I get it. Like you were saying, like there's this excitement that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that also there's this little voice that says, well, if we go to the hospital, we'll have the baby hospital equals baby, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, so yeah, if you can still do anything other than just have a contraction and then rest and wait for the next one to start, then be doing that at home. Um, And the car ride should be the worst car ride of your life. And if you're even remotely interested in getting into the car, then maybe it's it's still time to stay home. Yeah. And so another thing that's happening with COVID is that we have found in our experience as doulas that providers are really, really encouraging people to stay home for as long as they can. Like that they they don't need to be in the hospital for, you know, 12 or 16 hours before they give birth if they could be there for six to eight hours instead. Um, because if you get to the hospital, you're just going to be staying in your room the whole time. They're keeping people confined so to their rooms. There's no like walking. walking the halls or anything like that anymore. Yeah. They're really saying like, yeah. you're only getting admitted if you're in labor and you need to stay. And then if that's the case, you're staying in your room. So, so. stay at home. So stay at home. As long yeah. as you can. Because I mean, I don't know about you, but um, I don't think the hospital beds are very comfortable. I mean, I, I somehow... Did not have. That's right. I had five right. and have not had one in a hospital. So well, I, I can't can, even. I can say that my bed imagine. is more comfortable than a hospital bed. <laughs> but you know, if you're going to be hanging out, watching TV, sleeping, eating food, then why not do that in Absolutely. your home, in yep. your bed, in your sheets, with your Netflix queue, eating your snacks, walking around naked, being barefoot, sitting on the toilet, taking a shower, like doing all of those things that you can feel completely comfortable doing because yeah. you're in your home. And I think a. A, a big piece of that is good CBE education, mm-hmm. good feeling safe, mm-hmm. knowing your body, mm-hmm. knowing that the baby most likely isn't just going to fall out the next contraction. That's true. You know, like there's there's a lot of it, education, I feel like, that comes along with it. Like you said, people think hospital and baby, but they also think hospital and safety. Yeah. And I feel like somewhat of this COVID thing has kind of changed that a little bit. I think people probably are trying to stay at home a little bit mm-hmm. more because the hospitals do feel less safe. But, you know, really trying to get to the point where you trust your body mm-hmm. and you trust the fact that you're going to know when it's time mm-hmm. and your body, regardless, is going to know exactly what to do and how to bring that baby to her side. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think a common question is like, well, how will I know that the baby isn't going to be born on the side of the road? And so especially for your, <laughs> don't say out anything, on this one. I'm tapping yeah. out on this one, <laughs> especially as well for, for most first time parents, first, first time people give birth. Um, it's an average of two to three hours of pushing. So even if you walked out the door when you started that urge to push, you probably most likely would not have the baby in the car on the way there. Um, but, um, but, you know, this is also why we tell people, yeah, take a good childbirth education class. And I do think a doula is great because part of a doula's job is to help figure this out. Is it still okay to be at home or is it a good time to go to the hospital? So, um, but for people that want an epidural that we work with, um, we help them to stay home through early labor as well. Because the research tells us that if you get an epidural, once you've hit the active phase of labor, which is six through eight centimeters of dilation, then you are less likely to need Pitocin to keep your labor moving forward. 
and you're less likely to have a C-section. So we really help our clients to do that because it's kind of the same thing. Like if you can still be distracted by all of the other stuff, yep. then that's what we're going to encourage you to do. Um, I am not anti-epidural by any means. Um, I think that they are the most effective pain relief tool that we have available to us. Um, and I definitely respect that there are some people that for myriad reasons might choose to get an epidural earlier on. And to all of them, I say, good, great. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. perfect. You know, who should get an epidural? Anybody that wants one. Um, but if I can help people to like work through some of those fears and concerns about like the sensation and what's happening in their bodies and like why the sensation can get really strong, I'll try to do that just to hopefully save the epidural for active labor phase. Um, so um, for people that are getting an epidural, um, call your hospital beforehand, call the labor and delivery unit, um, ask them if they have peanut balls um, for people that are in labor and that have epidurals. It's an inflatable physiotherapy ball that looks like a packing peanut. Um, and that's an excellent tool to help labor progress if you have an epidural and, and or if you have to be in bed. Um, epidurals themselves do not increase the risk or rate of cesarean. Okay. It's the no, care of the it. patient okay. that has an epidural that increased the risk. Because if you get into bed and you're in like a semi-reclined position with all your weight on your tailbone and you're just laying there like a log, then your baby is going to have a really hard time getting into the best position to be born and coming down and through. Um, and what a peanut ball does is it um, you work with your nurse to um, change positions, usually every 30 to 45 minutes. And the peanut ball holds the legs open um, and it creates space and opportunity for the baby to come down and rotate through. So um, if, yeah, if, and if they don't have a peanut ball there, um, then you can get one yourself if you'd like to. They're like 15 or 20 bucks. You can order them at Dick's or Amazon or okay. whatever. Um, or you could just use like lots of big stacks of pillows and stuff. Um, so I think that's really important. And then the next thing to remember if you have an epidural, um, when it's time for you to push, and actually this is true for everybody, but we will always push most effectively when we are pushing with the urge rather than pushing because somebody's telling us to. It's um, a whole counting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if you get to the point and they tell you that you're 10 centimeters and it's time to start pushing, but mm -hmm. you can't even feel that you're having a contraction, talk to your nurse or your um, provider or the anesthesiologist about the fact that, um, you know, talk to them about turning your epidural down in strength some so that you can at least feel when you're having them. We have two types of receptors in our body. We have pain receptors and we have pressure receptors. And the epidurals, if they're really dense, will um, dampen all of those receptors so that we don't feel any pain or any pressure. But if we can turn down the strength of the epidural, and it's dosed individually. So, so epidurals work. Yeah. Yeah. Will you go into that? Yeah. Is it a constant drip? It is. Okay. So epidurals work. They numb the, um, the skin on the back, um, and they insert a catheter, this teeny tiny little tube, mm -hmm. into the epidural space. And it bathes the spinal column with medicine. And it's a combination of a narcotic and an anesthetic. It's usually like, um, what is it, bubivacaine or something like that, and then fentanyl. Okay. Um, and every anesthesiologist has their own preferred like, like amount. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and so most times when it's really dense, like a very strong epidural, like we can't even wiggle our toes, um, okay. and we can't move our legs, and we can't feel pressure. Um, but they can um, turn it down some so that we can at least feel pressure and some of that feedback about when we're having a contraction without feeling the sharp, ouchy pain part of it. Okay. Um, so for our clients and students, that's what we talk to them about. 
and what I would suggest to everybody listening, um, if you get to the pushing phase and you can't even feel when you're having one and somebody has to tell you, okay, you're having one right now and now mm-hmm. it's time for you to push, you're losing a lot of your power and progress um, by pushing when somebody else tells you to you instead of pushing tell, when you feel it yourself. Especially as a first time mom, pushing is one of those things mm-hmm. that, you know, I've I feel like I've only really ever pushed out a placenta, but that's been like actual, like physical trying to push out my, uh, my body is just beautifully you're an, you're weird. An outlier. I'm a very big outlier and I try not to talk about it on here because I really don't fit a lot of statistical averages, but I know from a fact of like pushing out a placenta because mm-hmm. I've actually done that and it's actually been me trying to push out a placenta. It, it would be hard. I feel like as a first time mom, if you're, completely numb and can't feel anything down there Mm -hmm. even knowing what muscles to use to push because it's 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 a very unique kind of set of muscles does that make sense it does you know i mean it does i the analogy that i make is like imagine that you just had dental work done and your whole mouth is numb and you have to eat a sandwich yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. You know, or imagine that your feet were numb from uh, your knees down and everything still worked, but you had to walk a mile down the road. You can't do it. Yeah. I mean, well, you can you do could. it. You absolutely you can do it. It's but just it takes be- a lot of concentration and practice and learning how to compensate with other muscles. OK. Um, so it definitely can be done. And it is done all the time. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, it you will push more effectively okay. if you can feel when you're having contractions versus when somebody else is telling you to. Um, and then um, I'll talk about pushing in a minute because I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of myself here. But I just <laughs> wanted to touch on the epidural part okay. um, because I know that that is part of the plan for a lot of people giving birth. And that's totally fine. Um, but for people that are not planning to have an epidural, when you get to the hospital, Um, uh, our recommendation, um, is to advocate strongly for intermittent fetal monitoring and freedom of movement. And what the research tells us is that people who have freedom of movement, change positions often, um, don't get in bed and lie down and stay there. Uh, people that labor in positions that allow gravity to help the baby move down, that they um, have shorter labors and push for less time and are less likely to have C-sections and all this all this different stuff. Um, our bodies are just made and our babies are made to come through with the assistance of gravity. And like um, what we teach in one of our classes is the, the baby, the way it navigates the pelvis, they don't just drop straight through in a straight line. They enter the pelvis and then they have to turn. And we kind of think of it as like a key and a lock Um, You know, if you had to open a deadbolt and you put the key in the deadbolt and then just stood back, nothing's going to happen, right? The lock won't unlock because you have to turn the key to throw the bolt. Well, with a baby, they are like the key going into the lock and then they have to turn to come through. And so it's our changing positions regularly that helps the baby to turn in the pelvis and to come through. And so that's how we help to make labor shorter and help us be less likely to have a C-section or get that you know, quote unquote, failure to progress diagnosis. Um, So um, planning to advocating for changing positions frequently, you know, making use of the room that you're in, you know. Do you have any recommendations for that? Like, are anything we other than using the bed are we anything other than getting in bed and lying flat on your back okay. like the really the possibilities are endless and there's so many excellent online resources yep. there's so much great stuff out there there's a wonderful book called the birth partner by penny simkin that we recommend yep. to everybody um, because it's helpful helpful information both for birth partners obviously and for the person giving birth Um, And she explains everything really clearly. Um, And then she has lots of online videos and resources. But just because you're not allowed to leave your room, Mm -hmm. let's just say happenstance during Mm -hmm. COVID, Mm -hmm. there are different things you can do within the room. Oh, yeah. So you can walk. um, You can uh, sway. um, You can raise the bed up and lean on the bed while you swing your hips from side to side. Um, You can do hands and knees on the bed. Um, You can 
turn the bed into like a giant throne where you raise the back of it and then lower the foot so it looks like a really big chair and then you can sit in it and we call that throne position. Um, you can sit on the toilet facing forwards. You can sit on the toilet straddling it and facing backwards and resting on a pillow. Um, you can sit on a birth ball. You can kneel and lean on the birth ball. So I mean, ton. see what I'm saying? Yeah, like there's, there's tons it's of stuff really you can do. Absolutely. anything other than being flat on your back in bed. Do what feels best for your body, like follow those impulses mm -hmm. and urges um, and move around. And the reason that intermittent monitoring is important is that, number one, that's what's evidence based mm -hmm. for healthy moms, healthy babies, low risk pregnancies. Um, we've known since the 1980s that continuous monitoring of the baby does not lead to improved outcomes. In fact, it leads to more C-sections without positively impacting the health of the person giving birth or their baby. So the evidence is really clear that um, if you, again, are healthy and have a low risk pregnancy, that intermittent monitoring, and that just means that they listen to the baby, you know, every um, starting out, it's usually like every 30 to 45 minutes. And then as you get closer to the pushing phase, they'll listen more frequently. Um, but um, it's hard to move the way that we just talked about, do all those positions, if you have to be hooked up to monitors all Absolutely. the time. And not impossible, but but it is more difficult. Um, if you have an epidural, you do have to have continuous monitoring. They have to listen to the baby's heart rate the whole time, just because there are risks from the epidural to the baby. Um, and then if you're on Pitocin, if you have a continuous drip of Pitocin, um, same thing. There are risks to the health of the baby. And so they have to listen to the baby's heart rate the whole time. But otherwise, oh, sorry, excuse me. If you're having um, really significant hypertension, they're mm -hmm. probably going to want to listen continuously to the baby and, and keep you hooked up and take your blood pressure frequently as well. Um, but, um, but yeah, otherwise, if again, you know, if you're healthy, if your baby's healthy and, a, and it's a low risk pregnancy, then advocate strongly for that intermittent monitoring. Absolutely. And then that also gets great freedom of movement so that you can use hydrotherapy. And that is mm -hmm. one of my favorite tools. So I think hydrotherapy, it's just a really fancy way of saying, you know, using some water. And it's usually either the shower mm -hmm. or the tub, um, like a full immersion in the tub. Um, and, you know, obviously you can do that stuff at home as well. Um, taking a shower, I think sometimes people get this idea in their head. They're like, well, I took a shower. Now what can I do? It's like, well, you could get in the shower again if you wanted to. Yeah. You're not washing your hair every time you're yeah, in there. Exactly. You know, so as long as you have hot water, yeah. you can get in the shower. And if it feels good, like just stay, stay in, in there. there. Yep. Um, I, I love when people have, um, labor balls, physiotherapy balls, mm -hmm. you know, um, and take that in the shower with you. You can sit on that, um, with hydrotherapy and using a shower, it's basically just point the hot water where it hurts. Maybe that's your back. Maybe that's your belly, like real low in front of your pubic bone. Mm -hmm. Your cervix is behind your pubic bone. So lots of times people get pain where their cervix is. And also because your baby's head is on your cervix. So, yeah, so if mean. it's, if it's ouchy there, point hot water at that spot. Um, and most homes now have a detachable shower head. Yeah. And um, I think it's a great job for a birth partner. So I, as a doula, do not get in the shower with my clients. Like that would just be weird, right? So I don't bring a swimsuit or anything like that. But I tell <laughs> I tell their partners to bring a swimsuit or at least a change of clothes because um, if uh, if the shower works, you're going to be holding that shower nozzle a for a really time. long time for so them. Funny. So have a have a change of clothes or some swim trunks or something yeah. like that. Um, but um, yeah, and I love so we, you mentioned earlier that mm -hmm. sometimes that that journey to the hospital can mm -hmm. impact your labor flow some and yep. kind of like you have to use your critical thinking brain to like answer questions and tell people what the last thing was that you ate and how much you weigh and which mm -hmm. pediatrician you've chosen and all of that stuff. And so sometimes all those questions can like pull you out of your laboring brain. Well, I think that getting into the shower and in the bathroom and closing the door is like Absolutely. a birth cave. Yep. And it's such an excellent way to get back like privacy and quiet. Um, 
one of my favorite tools in my doula bag is my like four strands of just like soft white twinkle lights. Um, and I will always take one of them into the bathroom to plug in. Um, and then the other ones I put around the room. Um, so toss some twinkle lights in your labor bag so that you can, instead of having to have the bright fluorescent lights on in the bathroom, just get your partner to plug that string in for you. Or you know what? Ask your nurse to do it. <laughs> and if you're feeling what? really saucy, you can be like, sorry, I'd have my doula do this for me, but you guys won't let her come in. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. And so and then go in the bathroom. If they've just finished listening to your baby, you've probably got 30 or 45 minutes where, you know, you can just be on your own in there. Go in, put on your twinkle lights. Um, put your playlist from Spotify on the cell phone, close the door, you and your partner just go in there and get some privacy. And that that like birth cave environment is a really like a no fail way to get that labor pattern back. I do it with my clients all the time. Make out a little bit while you're in there. Oh, yeah, sure. If they feel interested. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of snogging. It just makes me laugh because I'm never interested. I know in me that. either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like sometimes in life, yes, but like labor, no. I know, not so much at all. But it's it's good. It's it, another it's, one of those things that's cool in theory. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it really scientifically, is scientifically. It like right. it helps. Yes. but you know, yeah. not into that. Yeah. No, but anyways. Yeah. Cool. And then if they have a tub mm -hmm. at the place where you're planning to give birth, we, we try to encourage people to save the tub for transition. That's that last, it's the shortest, but it's the most intense phase of labor. Usually in the active labor phase, we cope pretty well with like position changes and massage and um, a little bit of aromatherapy and lots of encouragement. And it's transition where the comfort measures that had been working before kind of stop working as well. Um, and so the tub is a fantastic tool at that point. Um, I've heard people refer to it as a liquid epidural. I think that's BS. It's really not. <laughs> Only an epidural is an epidural. I'm just going to be really honest. I think if somebody's been told that the tub is a li liquid epidural and then they get in and it's not, they're like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Rude>. Yep. <laughs> so, but, but it does help a whole lot. So make sure the water's nice and warm. Get in there so that it covers your belly as much as possible. If it can't cover your belly, ask the nurse for a pitcher or cup or something for your partner to pour water over your belly and over your shoulders and stuff. Um, and um, relax deeply in between contractions. The tub often makes contractions space out just a tiny little bit. So the, the great benefit of it is that warm water helps people to relax deeply down through their bottoms, their whole bodies. Softness is one of the the best things that we can aim for mm -hmm. as we're coping with our contractions, um, keeping um, a soft body and a soft bottom. Um, there is no polite way to say this, so I just always say it the way that I think people will understand. What do I mean when I say a soft bottom? Well, a soft bottom is like the opposite of holding in a fart. Yeah. You just have to let everything be loose and relaxed. Because <laughs> if you're tightening all those muscles, yeah, you're yeah. holding your baby inside. So like good coping is staying with your breath, relaxing as deeply as you can in between contractions and keeping your bottom nice and soft. So that I know you're laughing at me. No, but it's good. It's good. I, I, I get it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's <laughs> it's good. I mean, I think once you once you can learn to just kind of why like kind of ride those waves and really truly relax and you know, I think a lot of it is is, you know, you gotta hold back, you can't be scared, you mm -hmm. know, you just gotta kind of relax into it. And so hopefully, you know, you've shared enough today that can People. I share one more Absolutely, thing? Absolutely, yes. Just one course, more. I promise course, it'll be course, really fast. Course. Only I because it. I referred to it earlier and I want okay. to make sure to circle back. Okay. With pushing, mm -hmm. try not to push while you're flat in your back. Okay. On your back, I mean. And if they go to pull the stirrups out to put your feet in, you can tell them that you don't want the stirrups. We're more likely to tear and get hip damage if we have our feet resting in stirrups. Do they still put most people's feet yes. in stirrups? Yes. Okay. And even if you have an epidural, you can ask your nurse to hold one leg and your partner to hold the other leg if need be. Um, like if you don't, if, you, if you're not able to hold them yourself. Um, 
But um, is it because trust, the stirrups are wider to the no, outside? No, it's, it- it's to hold legs that are so numb that the person giving birth can't hold them themselves. Okay. Um, and also it just does make a nice wide space for a person, usually a doctor, in a stool to scoot up right in between to to get the baby. Okay. But um, so whether you have an epidural or not, try to keep pushing um, in positions that allow gravity to help the baby move down. So like side lying, hands and knees, a semi-reclined position, um, basically anything other than flat on your back. And that was all I wanted to say. No, it was good. I, uh, it's funny. I have a, you know, I have people who help me with my kids. I have this beautiful, wonderful college girl named Maddie who used to work here at Latch Mama. And now she helps me with my babies. But, uh, she came home, she's, I don't know, like 20, and she just looked at me yesterday, and she's like, Melissa, did you know that you're not supposed to have a baby flat on your back? And I was like, <laughs> Maddie, I'm like, where did that come from? She goes, it, it was on a TikTok. She's like, there's something, there's just some girl who popped up on my TikTok, and she did this whole thing about like about water going going through a tunnel and, and how you're not supposed to be on your back when you have a baby. And I'm like, oh, thank God, there's yeah. something happening to these these this world right now where people are starting to learn that you don't she goes I never thought of having a baby any other way than I mean Maddie's nowhere near having a baby yeah but she was just like it was on TikTok yeah and they believe it because it's on TikTok so I feel like that might be the answer to everything <laughs> is my that next we platform need, we need to start sharing we need to start sharing birth tips on TikTok <laughs> <laughs> so then oh, we reach please people let us make TikTok while, while they're together. 20 yes we're gonna start some latch mama CBE educational birth videos on tiktok stay tuned everybody (laughs) cool thank you thank you